chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I know there's all kinds of crazy things going on in the world. And I had two prophecy updates, one a couple weeks ago and one about a month before that this summer on Sundays. So uh, I'm not going to keep talking about what's going on, but it is getting crazy out in the world. I encourage you to listen to those messages. If you haven't, uh, obviously I know there was a guy predicting that, you know, we'd be raptured uh, yesterday. I didn't even have to warn you about it because we know that the Antichrist will come before the rapture. Amen. So none of, I knew nobody at Blessed Hope is going to get fooled by that. I didn't get one person, do you think we're going to be raptured? Because we know better. But a lot of, you know, our brethren, you know, they get disturbed by those things. Maybe this is the day, you know. And what happens is they keep getting fooled, a lot of people, and then they stop getting their eyes off the real event that is coming up in the prophecies, and they get discouraged. Amen? So let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen? A lot of things have to happen, although you need to keep your eyes peeled. We've, we've been talking about these signs. These signs do lead to His coming. But... There needs to be a seven-year covenant that's made with the Antichrist and many that's broken in the middle of the, the seven-year covenant. And there needs to be a temple that's rebuilt so he can sit in the temple that show, to show himself as being God. Amen? You can't sit in the temple and show yourself as being God if the temple isn't rebuilt. So for people thinking, is this the day? You know, no. And the, and the Bible says before the rapture, the Antichrist comes first. Second Thessalonians 2, read it. It's clear as day. Anyway, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We looked at verse 5, and we honed in on the second part of verse 5 more than the first. I want to look at verse 5 with verse 6 right now. It says, It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. I did two messages on the secret power uh, uh, of music, one last Sunday and one several Sundays before that. Had an incredible response from both of those messages. I say that because that, that shows me that it's having an impact in people's lives. So I encourage you uh, to get those messages because that's a huge part of our lives. The most repeated command in the Bible, eight, over 800 times, is to de devote your musical life to God, to sing unto the Lord. It's not, about, it's not supposed to be about us, what makes us feel good. It's supposed to be about glorifying God, amen, with song and worship and praise. We, we deny ourselves as Christians, we follow Him, and then we're blessed, amen. There's nothing like worship music and worshiping Jesus, amen, lifting your hands to him and crying out to him in spirit and truth. There's nothing beyond that. And uh, anyway, I don't want to do a third message on that. I want to hone in, though, on something else he's saying here in verse 5. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the songs of Eminem or songs of, just fill in the blank, of some person who's foolish because they don't fear and love God. And they sing lyrics that are wicked or ungodly. But verse 6, For as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool, and this too is futility or emptiness. Okay? Read that again. What's he saying there? For as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool, and this too is futility. He's talking about ungodly humor, the humor of fools. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, to escape the trials that they're in in this world or the pain, they look for pleasure, whether it's drugs or what have you, to inebriate themselves, to inoculate themselves, or sometimes they look to godless humor. You know, we're supposed to look to Jesus and the power of His Spirit. Amen? And we're supposed to find fellowship with His Spirit and the joy of the Spirit that comes from being in fellowship with God and being forgiven, happy is the man whose sins are not credited to him. Amen. The fellowship, the koinonia of our brothers and sisters, there is that joy, and it's a real joy. See, what's interesting when he says this, for as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This, too, is futility. How many like to camp? How many like to build your campfire? How many know that some thorn bushes... <laughs> yeah, Mark's, Mark's simulating it for me right there. It just goes up in flames real quick. It looks real cool at first. It's there. It's like, wow, look at this fire. It's a bunch of noise, though. And then it just goes out real quick. And it's not even hot enough to, you can't even sustain it long enough to, to heat your coffee if you're a coffee drinker, right? Sure, you're not going to cook a steak with it. In other words, it's useless in the end. It's just a bunch of noise. It's fruitless. And that's how the godless humor is of this world. It doesn't do anything for you spiritually do a lot of harm because it can desensitize you toward between, you know, 
concerning that which is good and evil, and you find yourself laughing at evil as though it's no big deal, and then you run uh, in, in the situation to where the Bible warns that it's a very severe problem when, when believers no longer blush over evil. They're no longer sensitive to evil. And, you know, I remember Ellen DeGeneres, her producer, when uh, her TV sitcom was out before her talk show, uh, and, you know, she was one of the first that had come out with her homosexuality. And he said, we get people laughing, and that we were able to slip our message under the threshold of the door to get them to accept it. And our, our, our country and the way we view things, the way we view sin has totally changed. Uh, and humor is a big part of that. Uh, humor is great. True Christians laugh more than anybody, you know. I mean, if you've if you got the joy of the Lord, you know. I mean, there's a lot of, when I when fellowship my brothers and sisters, you know, we laugh. There's just, there's joy, you know. And there's nothing wrong with humor. Humor is a good thing God invented. He said laughter is good for the bones, amen. So God loves humor. God, I love it when, you know what, I love it when my grandchildren or my children laugh. And if my grandchildren are laughing in their grumpy mood, I take them, I pick them up, and I whoop them. No, I don't. I tickle them, you know, and they just start laughing, and they love to be tickled, you know. And little Justice came up to me just recently, and, you know, he's the littlest one, and he's, you know, barely talking, and he's saying just some words, but he can say, Papa, pick me up, okay, then pick him up. Then he says, tickle me, and then he crunches up because he sees it coming, and then, you know, just start tickling him, and he starts just laughing, and he can go for several minutes, you know. And it probably looks abusive because there's little red marks on his side for me tickling him so hard, you know. And Eli loves it too. And that's a God thing, man. God created those tickle buttons, you know. You ever try to tickle yourself? It doesn't really work, you see. But tickle the person next to you right now. No, don't do that. I'm just kidding, you know. Don't be careful trying to tickle me because I'm big and violent, and I don't mean to be so, but I've I got r fast reflexes, and I don't mean to hit people, but like Robert Severin, when he was with us, he found that out the hard way a couple times. Woohoo, man, so he had to be real careful when he tried to tickle me, you know? But I could just pretend I was going to tickle him, and he'd like wrink, crinkle up in like a corner, you know? So, but uh, laughter is a good thing, but everything can be perverted, amen? And Satan, Satan's a great perverter. So we talk about sex in the marriage. God says the marriage bed is undefiled. That's a good thing. But sex outside of marriage, you know, that becomes destructive. Just like I said, a fire in your fireplace is a beautiful thing. It has boundaries, but the fire outside the fireplace going up your walls and your sofa, that's very destructive. So God's created boundaries because he loves us and he cares about us. And he cares that we are spiritually right and that we obey his word. And we have to be careful we're not involved in coarse jesting. The Bible warns against that. In Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 8, we read this. But among you, there must be not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's serious. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things the wrath of God comes on, or the wrath, I'm sorry, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Disobedient, therefore do not be part partners or partakers with them. This is serious. He doesn't want us involved in coarse jesting. Those who are practicing coarse jesting and it's their way of life are on the list there. Read it. I'm, I don't make this up. It's Ephesians 5. It says they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's so serious. And since it's so serious, I have to speak to these issues. Because there are all kinds of professing Christians who are into coarse jesting or look at the filthiest comedians and, and watch them and aren't concerned that they use the F word every few words and, and that they're denigrating that which is godly sometimes or, uh, or they're making trivial that which is disgusting as though it's no big deal. And as believers, we've got to be serious about this. So I want to encourage you, just like I challenged you at the end of last message, to make sure you examine, you, you delete from your iPod any kind of music that's ungodly, that doesn't encourage you in the Lord, that encourages you in wickedness. I also encourage you to take a stand when it comes to filthy humor. First and foremost, in your own heart and in your own life. I love the psalmist's prayer. You know, let the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you. 
That's a good prayer, amen? That's a good prayer. God's timing is interesting because he knows when we're going through things and sometimes people think that God, that, that, that somebody calls me up. I get that all the time. Did somebody tell you I was going through this, you know? I get it all the time. No, but God calls me up, you know? God speaks even when I don't even know it a lot of times. Was, a lot of times when that happens, it's stuff that wasn't in my notes. It's just the Holy Spirit works that way. But I'll tell you what, God wants you to examine your heart. And the psalmist also prays, God, put a guard over my tongue, you know, because that's deadly. It's full of deadly poison. It's got that potential, James chapter 3, right? So we got to watch our own hearts, but we also have to watch what we watch because, remember, I told you Jesus teaches that, that principle, garbage in, garbage out. If a man store, man, an evil man takes from the evil that's stored up in his heart and brings it forth, and the good man brings from the good that's stored up in his heart and brings it forth, he said. So garbage in, garbage out, but beauty in, beauty out, amen? Therefore, think on these things, what sober things are true, right? Remember that, that passage, beautiful. We ended with that last week when we were talking about music. And I'm talking just for a few minutes about humor. You guys, there's peer pressure. A lot of you, most of us, you know, work in the secular world around people that don't know Jesus, and, and they're always telling, you know, terrible jokes, many of them. And you're either going to try to fit in so you don't seem like a Jesus freak or you don't seem different. And you're going to fit in and you're going to compromise and be conformed to the world. The Bible says don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. But be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Amen? So, and, and offer up your body as living sacrifices that you might prove God's perfect will in your life. You want his perfect will in your life? Don't be conformed to the world. Amen? Offer your body to the Lord and say, Lord, use me to your glory. And be serious when you're at work, you know. You have to say, take a decision now. You have to say, now, Lord, help me be strong. Someone says something that grieves your spirit, may it grieve my spirit. Because if you're a believer, his Holy Spirit lives in you, amen? And we should be grieved when evil is spoken. And I'll tell you what, if you're professing to be a Christian and you go along with dirty joking, I can tell you what they're thinking of you behind your back that you're not real, that your faith is a sham. They're not respecting you. That's why they'll try to get you to go to do things after work that you know aren't right, or they'll try to, they'll try to include you in things because they want to basically feel better and not feel convicted around you. But I'll tell you what, you take a stand and you say, I'm not going to laugh at that. Oh, yeah, there'll be a couple people that just, Psh. oh, man. But guess what? When people are hurting later on at your job or people are going through things, guess who they know has integrity, who they're going to respect, who's going to be sincere with them, who's going to be real? You. I've seen that. I've had jobs where, yeah, I had, I've, I've had a lot of secular jobs in the past, and I've had to say, okay, I'm not, I'm not laughing at that. You know, it's who I am, man. Take it or leave it. I'm going to love you and so forth. And it, pretty much every job I had, I uh, had the ear of certain people that had come to me, you know, even when the fellowship started, you know, uh, Ryan Harrison, who was an elder in our fellowship, uh, I'd worked with him for some time, and he knew I was different. And he'd cut up and, you know, whatever, you know, as a non-believer, would do what non-believers do and say, and I love the guy talking to him, encouraging the Lord. He saw I was different. I got to witness to him and share him, share with him. And before I knew it, you know, he invited me over to his house, and I did, uh, I witnessed to them, did a presentation. I saw Ryan come up in an altar call. Uh, Another brother came up at that altar call. Both became elders in the fellowship. Wow. You know, later, because they grew so much, and they're still bearing fruit to God's glory right now. And because you make a difference, you know. So I want to encourage you. And I know it could be hard, but God doesn't give us anything too hard. Amen? Be a real man, you know. Don't just go with the flow. Dead fish float where? Downstream. We're alive in Christ, man. We don't flow with the world. Amen? We go upstream. Oh, it's harder, man, but it's a blessing. And when the salmon goes upstream, it bears fruit in the end. Amen? It has offspring. And when we go against the tide, we have spiritual offspring. We bear spiritual fruit. Amen? So it, it can be tough. And you, you might say, man, I, I've already blown it, though, man. I've already, you know, it's going to be. Oh, no, just do it. <laughs> just repent and say, Lord, help me change. And help me not, go, not, not be involved in coarse jesting anymore. Not to laugh at their jokes, not to, not to uh, say jokes that are evil. Can you play it? Yeah. To me, some of the best humor is just spontaneous humor that's just playful, you know? 
I rarely, we'll laugh a lot during a message sometimes, but I rarely like put in a joke. Sometimes I'll put in a joke once in a blue moon that's just funny and it illustrates a point or something because it illustrates a point. But a lot of times it's just humor that just, because God says laughter is good and we just tend to laugh at things, right? Otherwise we cry over everything because the world's so messed up, amen? But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, so let's, and you know what? It's a lot harder to build something than to tear it down, amen? How hard is it to build a building? It takes a lot of workers, right? A lot of plans and specifications and, and money and energy, but it's pretty easy to demolish a building. But people would much rather see a building be demolished. If there's guys building a building over here and, and there's on scaffolding stuff and there's a building where, you know, <laughs> the big old deal's smashing it, you know, and you're, which, what do they look at? They look at that. It's a lot easier because people are into that, man. But as believers, we've got to be excited about the building, not the destruction, amen? And it's more work, but in the end, there's a place to stay, a place to live. And he's building his kingdom. And that we are his kingdom. And we need to build each other's up, other up. The Bible says not to tear each other down, you know. Let no corrupt communication, it says, come out of your mouth. But only those words that are good for edification. That means to build up. Edifice. Building each other up. So at your house, do you build each other up? People, if you live with other people. Do you pray, God, use me to build them up, or do you tear people down? Are you sarcastic and mean-spirited and make it all about you, where you want everything revolving around you? And, or you think, do you think, Lord, use me to your glory to build up people in my household, you know, to build up people around me, to love them, to encourage them, amen? That's important. That's what makes for healthy homes, amen? Are you building each other up in your homes? Is your speech pleasing to God? And it's not about just hearing a message because deep down all of us, I can see, I can see it right now in the congregation. We all say, yeah, this is right. But we can know what to do to do what's right but not do it if we don't walk in the Spirit. Paul talked about being powerless before he knew Christ in Romans chapter 7. But when he came to Jesus, who will set me free from this body of death, Jesus set him free. Amen. Then he had the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So there's victory through Christ, but we have to rely on him through prayer. We have to cry out to God, God, change the way I talk. You got you to do that. Now, is it his will that our, our speech is holy and uplifting and, and righteous? Yes or no? Okay, he says, when you ask according to his will, you what? You receive it. You have it. So simply just ask him and say, God, please. See, I did ask him once. Once? How many thousands of messages have you got to do the opposite sins from the evil one? The Bible says to pray without ceasing. We're supposed to be constantly crying out to God, saying, change my heart. Help my speech be pleasing to you. Help me to be a blessing to others. Amen? Now, it's interesting because... The context is very interesting here because he, and, I, and, and you, you've got it, so we'll move on hopefully, but that, that crackling of a thorn bush, the thing is, is when you're building a fire, right, logs, you need some, some kindling or some gasoline or some whatever, the lighter fluid, you know, to get that thing going. But I'll tell you what, a sustained fire is where the beauty takes place, where you can cook your food, where you can heat your, your coffee or whatever. And you know what? The Lord is our fire, amen? And we walk in Him. And we rest in Him. The Bible says He's a consuming fire. But for us, Scriptures say that the believer can dwell in the consuming fire. We can't see Him in all His glory yet, but we can dwell with Him, amen? And we're sustained. So, but there's another thing going on here. You have to look at, look at the context again. Look at verse 6, but look at verse 5, going into verse 6 again. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man. Don't lose sight of what he's saying there. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than, to, than for one to listen to the songs of fool, a song of fools, for as the crackling of, a thorn, of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool, and this too is futility. So it's not just the, the rebuke of a wise man is better than secular music, but it's also better than the empty humor in the world, the comedy that passes off. And, and Satan is very, very powerful. And just like he inspires people with music, he inspires evil people with evil humor. And, I mean, there's an array of night show hosts who use humor in a deprecating way that's very, very destructive to push a liberal agenda. Did you know that? 
you know those guys that, uh, uh, you know, on whatever nights they come on, they're not, they're not trying to get people closer to Jesus. Amen? They're not wanting them to be God-fearing, living holy and moral lives. They're typically for killing babies. They're typically for the destruction of biblical, traditional you know, marriage. Uh, and it's heartbreaking. And you have to be very careful. But what, now, it's interesting. Better is the rebuke of a wise man. That's a good thing. But you know what? Our flesh hates correction, doesn't it? But we need the rebuke of a wise man. We need to be those that are rebuked at times when we need to be corrected, amen, and accept it even though your flesh may not like it because God needs to do that in our lives. And we also need to be among those who lovingly rebuke others when they need to be corrected, amen? Correction is one of the most important things and one of the most lacked things in the body of Christ. And that's because it can be abused like anything else, amen? There are people that will correct uh, things that aren't, that don't need to be corrected, you know? You know, oh, wow, you know, her, her, her dress, you know, needs to be a half an inch shorter, you know? I mean, I'm not talking about dressing immodestly, but I'm just saying there's churches where they'll, like, measure things. I'm not kidding, you know? And it becomes this legalistic kind of thing. If you've been to Blessed Open any time long, you notice we spend time in the Word of God, amen? What does God call sin, amen? There's churches where it's sinful to play cards. It's sinful uh, for a woman to cut her hair. It's sinful for a man to have a beard, even though Jesus had a beard, and they pulled it out, it says. It just gets so unbiblical. The, the big man with the beard just gives a hearty amen back there. Amen. Amen. You can relate to that, man. <laughs> One of our big Jims. Uh, what's with being named Jim and being big? You know? Anyway, uh, in our fellowship, man, we've had a, a bunch of big Jims. There's Slim Jims, too. You know, we've had some Slim Jims. <laughs> had a few of them. Awesome guys. Bigger Jims always want to be slimmer Jims. Slimmer Jims always want to be bigger Jims, you know? I don't know how much truth there is, but there's another big Jim laughing, so there's got to be some to it. Anyway, I don't know where that came from. Stick with your notes. I don't think, hopefully that's not coarse jesting, you know? But anyway, uh, it's important that we lovingly rebuke at times. Not that we love to rebuke. I hate rebuking people, but I have to because it's part of my job, not as a pastor, but as a Christian. But it's even more so my job as a pastor. But what I'm trying to say, it's not just left to pastors and elders. One of the qualifications for an elder, you know, there's certain qualifications, but one of the qualifications in Titus chapter 1 is that they may be able to refute those who teach false teaching. That's usually overlooked when elders are appointed in the most churches. A lot of, lot of elders, even pastors, never correct false teaching. They just let it run amok because they don't want to, you know, rock the boat. Speaking of rebuking false teaching, we did a video that we're pretty much done with, really close, I mean, called The Shack of Lies. I mean, we're pretty much done with it. We showed it Wednesday, but I mean, these get packaged now. So, uh, and it was we, under two hours. We kept it under two hours. Can you believe that? You know? And how was that? The people saw it. Was it pretty eye-opening? I want to encourage you because we had a really powerful response. One brother said, this is like they sold their souls, but just for the church, you know? And I don't know if it's quite that, but uh, it's eye-popping because we show uh, young, Paul Young, just spouting off his heresies with, through clips and through movie clips and, and show you right in, his own, right in his book what he's saying. And it's very alarming, especially at the end. It has a very strong conclusion by showing how a lot of what he's teaching, even by his own admission, parallels the New Age teaching that's part of the occult, actually. Occult worldview. So I encourage you to get that and pass it out. We're going we're gonna to make uh, the, in the regular package, but we're also going to make it in the very inexpensive package, several, so you can get a bunch and pass them out to people. One brother said, man, I hope you put out 20 million of these, just like 20 million books sold. That's probably not going to happen, you know, but let's get as many out as we can because it's a real eye-popper when you watch it, you'll be like, I had no idea this guy was teaching these things. That's how many people are. 
So we need to, there needs to be a rebuking that goes on at times to correct. If I'm going the wrong direction and I'm headed toward a cliff, right, I need to be rebuked, amen? Joe, you're going to destroy yourself. And someone who says, Joe, you're going to fall, is that a good person or a bad person? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing, amen? We need to be rebuked at times. And this is very, very, I'm talking about constructive criticism. Okay, I'm not talking about sin sniffing, where you're just trying to find something on somebody. Trying to find, can I, find, can I try to prove this guy wrong in some way so I can look big or good? That's sinful. That's wicked. That's from the flesh. It should be that with the motivation of, I want to build up my brothers and sisters. I want to see them become more like Jesus. Amen? And I'm not holier than thou. It's by the grace of God that I go. And God, please correct me. And if I'm not hearing from your voice, use one of my brothers or sisters to say, hey, you know, you're blown in this area. I love you. But hey, man, just want to encourage you. But make sure you have to know the scripture. Amen? So you don't start saying, hey, you know, it's wrong to have a beard. I sat through a fellowship where they were saying just that, you know, just visit it. He was talking about how sinful it was to have a beard, you know. That was very, very heartbreaking indeed. Now, uh, Solomon is saying, better is a rebuke of a wise man. There was a wise man in Solomon's life before he was really even aware of it that saved his dad from destroying himself. You know what that wise man's name was? Nathan. Because David's dad, and this is perhaps one of the things that Solomon has in mind when he writes better as a rebuke of a wise man in the Songs of Fools, his dad, David, had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had committed murder. And his dad was trying to cover up his adultery, and that's where the murder happened. It was like a cover-up. And he had blood guiltness about him. He was in huge trouble. In fact, the Bible says murderers and adulterers, murderers go to the lake of fire. Adulterers will not inherit God's kingdom. Don't be deceived, you know. And David was going the wrong route, and he needed correction. Then the prophet Nathan told him a story about a man who took somebody else's lamb, which was his pet, that slept on the, guy, the bottom of the guy's bed. And even though he had all these other lambs, he killed that lamb because he didn't want to kill one of his own and roasted it for his friends. And David was like, just so angry. So let me know who that man is. I want to make him pay. And then I don't know if it was Nathan with his bony finger and a thunderous voice or Nathan in a very calm, gentle way. But he said, thou art the man. You're the guy. You took Bathsheba. David had taken, he wasn't supposed to assemble wives to himself. He, he did that, contrary to the Mosaic law, which said the king is not supposed to multiply wives to himself. But he took another man's wife, and he was guilty, and he had to repent. Better is the rebuke of a wise man. Nathan was the wise man that rebuked him, and it stopped David in his tracks and he repented. How serious was it? He cried out to God, you know, cast me not away from thy presence. Chapter 51 of the book of Psalms. Right? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's how serious that was. Being jettisoned from God's presence. Spit out. And not having the Holy Spirit. And God forgave him, amen. God restored him. And God used David in mighty ways after that. There was restoration, amen? But that restoration, it doesn't look like it would have happened if it wasn't for the rebuke of what? A wise man, amen? See how important that is? Because you could be going one direction and you can have full stop because God uses someone in your life or because God uses you in the life of someone else. Now, if, what if God said to Nathan, you need to go talk to him and tell him to repent or else, you know? What if Nathan didn't do that? I don't want to offend David. You know, he's the king. You know, he might even ask for my head on a platter. I don't want to do that. Would that be loving of Nathan? No. He wouldn't be serving God, and he wouldn't be loving his neighbor, and he wouldn't be loving King David. But Solomon, David's son, who was born out of that relationship, that's why I said he couldn't have been aware of what was going on, but he was already in part of the picture. Better is a rebuke of a wise man than a song of fools. 
we need to take, serious, take this seriously because right now, the church in the United States of America is becoming so apathetic and so pathetic because it's so becoming tolerant of sin is afraid to say what's right, what's wrong. And I've told you before, more than once in the Old Testament, God comes down on the spiritual leaders because he says they failed to make a distinction between that which is good and evil or that which is holy and profane. They didn't make a distinction. And that's what's happening in our culture today. That's because we see people around us involved in sin or, or we get involved in sin and then we just start to tolerate it. And that infects the church and it becomes very destructive and it destroys our walks with God. We cannot compromise in these areas. Amen? And the Bible warns, even in the Old Testament, the prophets, you know, they said to the false prophets or to the true prophets even too, speak to us smooth things. You know, don't warn us. Speak to us smooth things. And it's the, it says of the false prophets, they were, like, or they were like dogs that didn't bark. Can you imagine getting a watchdog? Got this wonderful, you know, Rottweiler. Doberman Pinscher. Mastiff. Take your pick. And you're like, you're going on vacation and you stick in your house and you got two of them. No, you got three. You've got a big old bull mastiff, a, a Doberman Pinscher, and a Rottweiler. You're like, they're all new and they were trained by three different companies that, that train guard dogs. And you come back and your whole house is ransacked. And you've got videotape. You turn on and you say, what happened? And you see them all licking them. One of your dogs shows them the silverware over here, you know. You'd be kind of ticked off, right? I'd be messed up. Well, that's what it's like when teachers, when pastors, when elders don't warn about the evil that's coming in the church. When things like the shack come in and they don't bother to test it. And I know some guys just don't look. We need to look before we endorse something. Amen? We examine everything carefully. The Bible says, hold fast to that which is good. And then you've got all kinds of thousands of pastors endorsing the book. When you watch that video, if you haven't seen it yet, your eyes will pop out almost. Because it's so horrendous what's being taught by this guy. He's taking a lot of people into apostasy and contributing to the last days apostasy that the Bible warns about. Now, it's interesting because Solomon, he really appreciated correction. And you know, David appreciated that correction from Nathan. In Psalm 141, verse 5, we read, David writes, Let the righteous smite me. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. So don't be one of those folks that just doesn't want correction because you'll end up going the wrong direction if you're in error and you'll tune people out who want to help you and you'll end up being destroyed in the end. And I think it's interesting that throughout Proverbs, who wrote Proverbs? Solomon, amen. Throughout Proverbs, he talks about the importance importance of the virtue of corrective criticism. Criticism or, that, or correction that is meant in love. Notice what David says. Do not, rep oh, I'm sorry, what David says here, he says, let the righteous smite me in kindness. It's really a kind act, and it should be done in kindness. It could be a bad act. You can move people away from the Lord because you come in the wrong spirit and with some kind of sense of haughtiness and some kind of sense of you're esteeming yourself higher than them and, you, and you're arrogant and holier than thou and you're acting like you're something else. But it's by the grace of God that you take your next breath. So we should be great humility when we correct people. Amen? And we should do it in love. But look at what Solomon says about correcting in the book of Proverbs. Just back up. One book. Proverbs chapter 12. Verse 1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is what? Is stupid. Look at that again. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. If you, if you love discipline and you love it when people help you out and try to encourage you to do what's right, praise God. Then you love knowledge. But do you hate reproof? Do you hate being corrected? Look at what the scriptures say you are. I'm just pointing it out. Let, you know, Better is the rebuke of a wise man. I'm trying to be a wise man here, pointing to Scripture. Don't be stupid. Accept correction. Don't think that you could never be wrong. Don't be hypersensitive when someone tries to correct you. 
Take it in consideration. Pray about it. If, it, if it's right, accept it. Oh, but this part was wrong. Well, disregard the parts that are wrong. See if there's something that's right in there that can help you out. It, it'll bless you in the end, amen? Hey, when you're in a family, I've got a wife and I've got a few kids, and you're going to get corrected, whether your dad, mom, or one of the kids. <laughs> you know you're going to hear it from time to time when if, if there's an area where you're, you know, you're not seeing something straight or you have a wrong understanding of something, it happens to all of us where we need other people to help give us insight. We may only see part of a situation. And we might act on that before there's more insight given. And we all need to be open to that. Amen? Proverbs chapter, uh, well, back up a chapter, a couple chapters. Go to chapter 9, verse 8. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. There's mockers that just, you know, they're just mockers, and they mock God and everything, and they mock his word. And if you waste your time with certain people who are already just sold out to evil, it's just going to, it's not going to do you a lot of good, he's saying here. Uh, so it's interesting because he says, do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a what? A wise man, and he will what? Love you. Amen. You know, children, after they're corrected, if they're corrected in a loving way, so often, not always, but often they love their parents more. I've known that with my kids, you know. When I've disciplined them and, and I do it steadily, it actually builds my relationship where they know I love them. And they know it hurts me too. They know it's like, I'm not having fun doing this, but I'm doing it because I know it's for their good and I care about them. They, there's something intuitive with a lot of children now, some children become scoffers, and they harden their hearts, and it becomes the opposite. We've all heard of kids. Uh, I was just hearing uh, Joe Pirro was telling me uh, last week that one of his children was on a uh, soccer team, and they've been on a lot of soccer teams, so I, get, I, I know I'm not pointing one specific one out. And, uh, and a couple of the kids came up to his, one of his daughters and said, you know, it's, it's neat that you have parents that, that, that care about you enough to discipline you. We wish we had parents like that. Isn't that weird? You know? Was that you, Camille, or Emma? I'm going to start picking on all the Puro girls. And who are you pointing at? Oh, it was you, Emma? Are you the one that said that, or are you the one that they said it to? Yeah, I know. I'm teasing you. Praise the Lord. That was Emma. I didn't even know it was Emma. I thought it could have been Shiloh or whoever, but praise God. Did I get the story straight? Okay. <laughs> How dare you correct me in public? <laughs> Why don't you share the story quickly? What happened real quick? Oh, football team in college. Okay. Well, that's a separate story than the one he told me. It was one of the, I think it was one of your little sisters. But there's, there it is again, you know, praise God. So where's Joe? Where's your dad? Let's straighten this thing out. <laughs> Unless I understood it wrong, but that still is, uh, that's the same thing right there. But one of, the little, one, of the, one of your little sisters, he just told me recently that that had happened uh, where a couple of the kids from the, came to him and said, came to her, can't believe, that's so, so awesome that you have parents that do that, you know. Amen. And then you give us more details of your story, too, because that one's cool. Okay, I'm just teasing because you don't have a mic. I'm embarrassing her. Uh, but you want to be a wise person, and you know what? The Bible says uh, if you hang out with a wise person, you'll become wise. So if you don't want to be wise and you reject the counsel of the wise, you'll become foolish, and eventually you'll become a scoffer. You'll mark, mock the wisdom of God. Uh, now, look at 13.1, a wise son accepts his father's discipline. Are you a wise son or daughter? A wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to a rebuke. Okay? Go to chapter 13, verse 18. 13, verse 18. Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof, that's correction, will be what? Honored. Look at chapter 15, verse 5. 15.5. A fool rejects his father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. Wow, look at chapter 15, verse 32. He who neglects discipline despises himself. In other words, you're really hating yourself. 
And what he's saying there is you're really destroying yourself. And you think by rejecting discipline and correction and so forth that you're helping yourself? No, really, you're destroying yourself. But he who listens to reproof acquires what? Understanding. Wow. Look at chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 10. A rebuke goes deeper into one who has understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. Wow. In other words, you could beat a fool silly and he still won't get it. He'll still end up scoffing in the end. But one who is wise, it becomes, it goes deep into their hearts. Chapter 19, Proverbs chapter 19, verse, 20, verse 25. Strike a scoffer and the naive may become shrewd. In other words, the scoffer may not learn from it. There's different types of scoffers. Some will repent, you know. The Bible's a little bit more complicated than we want to understand it sometimes. But uh, guess what? Strike a scoffer and the naive may become shrewd. Those who aren't scoffers, but they're just naive, the low end of foolishness. They're, they're, not, they're not having hard in their hearts to become scoffers yet. They'll learn from that, you know, when they see the discipline. But reprove one who has understanding, and he will gain knowledge. Uh, chapter 21 of Proverbs, verse 11. When the scoffer is punished, thy naive become wise. Becomes wise. But when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. Chapter 25. Chapter 25. A couple chapters getting toward the end here of Proverbs. We've gone through quite a few of them. Uh, verse 12. I love this one, too. Chapter 25, verse 12. Like an earring of gold... An ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. It's beautiful. How many of you are grateful that God has put wise people in your life? Amen. And you know what? They're probably grateful for you too because if, if you just raise your hand, you're probably a wise person. And you're a wise person in their lives as well. Because guess what? If you, if you raise your hand or, that, or your heart was to raise your hand and you're grateful for that, guess what happens? That means that you've attained wisdom. And it says of those who accept correction and reproof that they become what? Wise. And you become wise. And, and now you're used in other people's lives and their lives. And as the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Amen? How many of you cook and how many have to pull out that little round piece of iron to, on your blade, right? To sharpen it up real quick, you know? We sharpen each other. Amen? And that's what God calls us to. And it's very important, you know? And I... I know, I know, uh, I've told you before, there's a formula. I mean, I don't know, by the grace of God, he's got our, he's got our uh, CDs and, you know, DVDs all over the world, and we're having, a, by the grace of God, a huge impact in certain ways. But I, I knew the formula, and I never did it. I wouldn't do it. I read, there were books on church growth, you know, and not shaking the boat, you know, having really short messages, and be light on sin. It's basically, I mean, they don't say, it, be light on sin, but they say it, <laughs> you know? And I always shake my head saying, what in the world, man? Because what happens when you do that, that's no longer your, ch no longer Jesus' church. It's what? Your church. It's your message. It's your people. When you go seeker sensitive and you try not to offend anybody because you're not really helping them, you know? And we live in a world today, isn't it true, where nobody wants correction, What's happening at the universities? Have you seen what's been going on around our country? They have safe places. You know, our amendments are under attack, especially for free speech. And universities that were once known as bastions of free speech are now saying they won't allow those who disagree with their liberal mantras to speak on the campuses. Isn't that crazy? They have to have safe places for the students in case they hear some truth. They give them Play-Doh, really, college students, university students. Uh, some of the most expensive universities, they'll give them Play-Doh to play with Play-Doh so they don't have to be confronted with truth. So their view isn't challenged. Remember, Satan's the father of lies. We have the upper hand, those who know Jesus, with truth. He is truth. You can see this going on in our nation right now. Oh, but there's some belligerent people that are just full-blown evil and that they're like Nazis and they would encourage violence and destruction and so forth. Well, if somebody is literally con in encouraging destruction of other people and so forth and telling people, you know, and, and it, I'm all for, per personally, I do believe you, there are certain things you don't shout fire in a, in a, you can't shout fire in a theater, right? But there's a lot of very godly people 
that can't go to these universities who used to be able to go to universities and people or some people with very conservative values that are gentle as doves but they can't speak and that's because people don't like correction anymore in our country do you understand that we're in that time and that's been happening in the church too do you know that you understand that I'll tell you what, we got a lot of videos, and I've, I've told, we've said it before, I put some videos out, I say, hey, Tony, be ready to see our throats get slit when this one comes out. We're going to get cut off by this group of people who loves our ministry. And sure enough, it happened. I told them right before I go, look what's going to happen. Had opportunity to speak on a radio station, offered a monthly time slot on hundreds of stations. And I knew when the video came out, not long after I got that offer, and I'd been on that program a couple times, that... I knew right when, they, right when Left Behind or Left Straight came out, I was going to lose that opportunity. But you know what? I'd rather the truth, truth come out and people be ready for the end and pay attention to what Jesus is saying, amen, than, than to be speaking on hundreds of stations as a guest on a monthly basis. Because I want what God wants. If this fellowship only had three people in it and they were Jesus lovers, I'd much rather have that than hundreds of people that are just there because there's free ice cream at the end of the service. And no, I'm sorry, there's not free ice cream at the end of the service in our fellowship, you know. Sorry about that. I think there's, like, going to be some coffee and stuff. I don't know if they got that set up yet, but we're working on that, you know. Uh, we have that before service, but there's going to be a machine and stuff, which is cool. I, I was invited, and I've spoken, I don't know, four or five times I've done, uh, you know, ministry crusades in, in different, in Netherlands, just four or five times spoke at different churches. And one time I spoke uh, at a church and, and a gal came up, for different people came up for salvation and a gal came up and got saved. And I got invited back the next year by the biggest event that they hold in the Netherlands to speak to the adults and to the youth because the guy that puts on that event, and I'm not even going to say the name of it, my wife and a few different people were with us from this fellowship, because the, the man who puts that on, it was his daughter that got saved. He was so excited. So he brought me to speak. And I spoke, you know, there, you know, they had different things going on, but I spoke to thousands of uh, adults at one meeting. And then I was supposed to speak to the youth as well. And I was going to do a presentation. They sold their souls for rock and roll, warned the youth about what's going on, because the eyes, that's why they kept bringing me out, because so many people, people were getting saved, eyes were opening up. But those who were running the youth program took me aside and said, hey, you know what, uh, you know, we just want to let you know that we, we, we're not going to have you speak. You know, what am I going to say? I was just invited. I'm going to be disinvited. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to complain. I was just like, huh. I go, why? I go, they go, well, you know, you're too straightforward, you know. You just, you just, they said, you're just too straightforward, and you just, you're just straightforward. And we have a philosophy of going sideways when we talk to our young people, you know. And he said, that's how a lot of you American preachers are. You're straightforward. And he goes, the Netherlands, we're different. The Netherlands is very liberal. Yeah, you are. You know, many of you. There's many godly people in the Netherlands, too, including Bert Dornbos and, you know, people that uh, have worked with me there and so forth. Awesome people that love Jesus. But it was really heartbreaking. And when one of the young people heard that I was going to be speaking at the event, he came up to me and said, stinky doctors. I go, what's that? He goes, in, in Holland here, that's what we call doctors, or we call preachers, who when there's an infection that's deadly, they just put a bandaid over it. And it causes the wound. It doesn't heal the wound. It becomes stinky, and it kills you. And that's what a lot of our pastors, our preachers are doing. They're not getting to the root of the problem. And the problem in the Netherlands, he said, a lot of it is we love all the evil that's out there, and we don't want to warn about it, you know. He goes, they're stinky doctors. That stuck in my head, you know, because that fit Jeremiah, which warns about those who heal the wounds of God's people superficially, and they wash, they whitewash the walls. They don't heal the breach and so forth. And so we have to be among those as believers in these days that love people enough to warn them, amen? If you know me, I'm not breathing fire, you know. If anyone knows me, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll give you a hug and cuddle you before I rebuke you, you know, but... If you're doing something evil, I'm going to hopefully love you enough to tell you you're going the wrong way, man. You can't do that. You're going to hurt your family. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to give God a black eye, you know, being disrepute upon the gospel. 
you know, and I encourage you, turn back. You know, I'm going to love you. Not perfect at it. I'm growing in it, as we all are. But we need to grow. Amen? We need to love each other. And one of my life verses is First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. It says, we urge you then, this is a, my ministry verse, one of my ministry verses that I think about as a pastor. We urge you, brethren, but it's not just written to pastors. It's written to all of us. We urge you, brethren, warn the unruly. Or the NASB, admonish the unruly admonish or warn those who are unruly. Then the next part says, encourage the faint-hearted. Those who are trying to go on, but they're, whew, man, they're not, because it's not a sprint. Christian walks, it's a marathon, amen? They're faint-hearted, you encourage them. Come on, brother, keep going. Don't grow weary in well-doing, man. We're with you. God will get you through it. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Help the weak. Be with, uh, help the weak, uh, be with everyone. Wow, it's amazing. Help the weak, those who are weak. As a pastor, you can get frustrated with those who are weak and just give up, or you can say, hey, you know what? Jesus came to help the weak, and I'm the weak he helped too, amen? He gave me life from the dead. Talk about being weak, I was dead in my sins. Now we're the hands and feet of Christ, amen? And this is for the brethren, not just pastors. We're supposed to encourage the faint-hearted. We're supposed to warn those who are unruly. We're supposed to help those who are weak. 2 Thessalonians 3.15 says, Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. We're part of the family of God. We're talking about the church. We need to warn people. We need to encourage people. We need to love people. And sometimes people get out of line, even when they mean to do right sometimes. Sometimes they become pharisaical, you know. I read about John Wesley. John Wesley is one of my favorite preachers in the past. I mean, in the 1700s, John Wesley, God, we, God used that man, his brother Charles Wesley, wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Christmas songs, and more, more hymns than just about anybody, beautiful hymns. And God used those two men. Through them came the Wesleyan churches, Methodism, the Methodist churches, Wesleyan holiness churches, Church of the Nazarene. I mean, millions of people eventually saved through their ministry. That's just amazing. And Wesley was very strong about preaching holiness because the church in his day was very apathetic. Many of them had the frozen chosen mentality. Hey, we're chose, you know, chosen, and therefore we're either predestined to hell or salvation. And they didn't have personal responsibility, many of them. And Wesley said, no, you have a responsibility for God, and you have to choose life or not choose life. You need to follow him and, or not, you know, be serious about your walk. And he was rejected mainly a lot. You know, he was part of the Church of England, uh, you know, which at, back in those days, I mean, that was, that was the church in England, and he was a member, but guess what? They never let him preach in their churches because he did open-air preaching about you must be born again, and they didn't want to hear that message. But he was preaching in one place, and a lady came up, and she had been known as a critical lady in that congregation, and she was staring at his new tie the whole time. And she came up to him afterwards, and she said, you offend me. He goes, I'm sorry, what did I? It was your tie. Your strands from your bow tie hang down way too long. I'm sorry, madam, to offend you. Uh, does anybody here have any shears? The people that were left, the lady had some shears. He gave her the shears. He said, you can go ahead. I give you permission to trim them as you see fit. And he trimmed his little strands from his bow tie. And he says, does that make you happy? Are you, is that, is that acceptable to you? And she says, yes, it is. And she said, he said, well, I don't think you would mind then me giving you a bit of correction. Can I have the shears? And she gave him the shears. He goes, can you please stick out your tongue? Because I find your tongue far too long. And he took her tongue, and he, no, he didn't do that part, you know. Uh, I love Wesley. I don't think that was maybe, that was a very creative moment. Maybe not his best moment. It wasn't probably correct and gentleness, but you think she got the point, amen? Uh, and the tongue is far more deadly than too long of a strand from a tie, amen? Don't make mountains out of mohills, amen? Don't freak out over the little things. Love people, amen? And watch your tongue. Make sure you're encouraging people and you're using it to rebuke people in a loving, uh, kind way. 
uh, we're given a mandate in Scripture to warn people so they don't perish. Warning those who are on the outside that aren't in the fellowship, that aren't Christians, to repent and turn. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. Warning those who are in the church who would be going astray to turn back to the Lord. And Ezekiel and Jeremiah were radical prophets of God. And it was hard to be a prophet of God because the false prophets were a majority. If you study the scriptures, you'll see very often the majority are the liberals in the church or the legalists in the church, but those who, not those who are in a straight and narrow. And in Jeremiah and Ezekiel's day, these guys were very liberal and not encouraging people to turn back from their sin. You know? And you see that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel, in chapter 13, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Because with lies... You have strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. What's happening there? A wicked person goes into, his, into perversion, into wickedness, and the false prophets say you'll still have life. Once you've been saved, you're always saved. You'll still have life. You don't have to repent. And they don't return from their wickedness. And it was a tough job being a Jeremiah, being an Isaiah who was sawn in half. Being a Jeremiah who was thrown in a ditch and left for dead until God rescued him. It's a tough job speaking the truth at times. What happened to Jesus, who is the truth, crucified? Elijah said, which of the prophets have you not persecuted? Right? The Bible says, woe unto you when all men speak what? Well of you. When everybody speaks well of you, oh, 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 you don't get any criticism? It might be because you have a message that doesn't offend anybody. Amen? I'd rather give the rebuke of a wise man and speak truth and offend some people because I love them, because God loves them, and he wants to win them and have them get upset with me than to pat people on the back and watch them go into hell forever and then on judgment day hear their screams against me because I led them astray because I wanted to be loved and accepted by man. The Bible says the fear of man is a snare. Amen? Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And I know that's true. Sometimes I become people's enemy because I tell the truth, you know? But that's going to be true with you as well. But praise God, guess what? When you speak the truth in love, and people are warned and they heed those warnings, it says like you're like a gold earring. You're, you're, you're a blessing. You're like a, a, a glass of cold water. So we end up having fellowship with brothers and sisters who love each other. What kind of, what is it like? It's beautiful. I can't tell you how many people come to this fellowship and they just love the fellowship because they see the peace and the joy. It's because you have people that are walking in love and encouraging each other. Not perfect, but growing in Jesus. We have a perfect Savior. But God warns Ezekiel because he knows. You know, Jeremiah got upset and Ezekiel was like, Jeremiah was like, Stop, God. He didn't want to anymore. You've deceived me, God, because no one was accepting his message. What's going on? And whoa, it got crazy. And then he had to be straightened out by God. Ezekiel, you know, he was tempted not to, not to warn because it could cost you your life. And look what God says to Ezekiel because he warned him not to be like those false prophets who don't give the warnings. Ezekiel chapter 33. Son of man, speak to your countrymen and say to them, when I bring a sword against a land, and the people of that land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes his life, his life or his blood will be on his own head. He'll be responsible because he did not heed the warning of the watchman. Since he heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning, his blood will be on his own head. If he had taken warning, he would have saved himself. But listen to this. But if the watchman, uh, watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, that man will be taken away because of his sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood. Wow. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. 
So hear the word I speak and give them warning for me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, he will surely die. And you do not speak out. And you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways. That wicked man will die for his sin. And I will hold you accountable for his blood. If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, he will die for it. And if a wicked man turns away from his wickedness and does what is right, what is just and right, he will live by doing so. In the New Testament context, if we refuse to warn people about the judgment to come, Paul said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel, you know. We're held responsible. In fact, Paul said to the Jews who he warned in Acts chapter 18, verse 6, but when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. When Paul was preaching not to the lost Jews, but to the church, Christians, believers, you know, he encouraged them to be faithful to preach all of God's word, the whole counsel of the scripture. And in Acts 20, he talked about how he did not shun from declaring the whole counsel of God. He even went door to door telling people to repent. Uh, and then he says in chapter 20, listen to this of Acts. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel or will of God. Amen. So like the watchman that watch, walks on the city walls, if he, de- if he sees an invader coming and he doesn't do anything about it, and he lets it happen, he loses life. And Paul took what was given to Ezekiel and saw that it was applied to him as an apostle. And he preached the gospel. So he could say, I'm clear from the blood of all men. Now, if, now I'm sure every one of us would have a hard time saying that we've done that perfectly or even close, right? So what do we do? We say, Lord, forgive me, amen? We want to be cleansed of our, our shortcomings, amen? But then we say, Lord, help me be better at it. And he'll cleanse us if we're sincere. We ask for forgiveness. But help us to be better watchmen. Help us to care enough about our brothers and sisters that if we see them go astray, we don't say, hey, you know what? I'm here for you no matter what choices you make. Even if you choose to do evil with your life, it's okay. I love you. And I, I don't want to offend you. That's not love. That's, you're not loving that person. You're patting them on the back while they're going to hell. You have to love them enough to say, you have to turn. I'm going to love you even if you don't turn, but you have to turn or you're going to destroy yourself. One, another one of my ministry verses is Colossians 1.28, one of my life verses for ministry where Paul says of Jesus, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so that we may present every man a complete in Christ. I warn because I want to present everybody here at Blessed Hope and everybody hears my voice complete in Jesus. In Christ, forgiven of their sins, knowing him, walking after him. Amen? How do we do it? How do we minister to those who are lost? We have to minister. We have to warn them if they're, or those who are backslidden. James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20, it says, Brethren, if any of you, brethren, brothers, Christians, if any of you turns from the truth, and one brings, it's the last two verses of James, and one brings him back, He'll save a soul from death, a soul, and hide a multitude of sins. Why? Because that person's soul, in chapter 1, verse 27, it says, to, of that same book, chapter 1, verse 27, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It's his word that saves us. But if, brethren, if you turn from the word, turn from the truth, and you bring him back, you'll save his soul from death and hide multitude of sins because he's come back, he's been cleansed again by the blood of Jesus. So we have to bring people back. But how do we do it? In a spirit of gentleness. Amen? It says, if you see a brother who is caught in a trespass, a sin, he's fallen away, he's involved, he's entangled in the sin, let those of you who are spiritual restore him in a spirit of, anybody remember that one? In a spirit of gentleness. Amen? Consider your own self so you too will not be tempted. In other words, if you're like, I can't believe that sister fell. I'll teach her. And then you go with a haughty attitude. Woo, you are already falling. The Bible says pride becomes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Amen? 
So you got to be really careful. You're humble and say, wow, that could be me. God, help me to love that person as I love myself. That's a sister. That's a brother in the Lord. They're a family member. I want to see them restored as a family member. Amen? And, help, and those who are spiritual. If you're not walking with God, don't try to help someone out spiritually. You know? Because I'll tell you what. It's, uh, what does he mean? Those who are spiritual and spiritual gentleness. He says the fruit of the Spirit right before that, a few verses before that, chapter 5, verse uh, 20, 20, 21, 22. He says the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, so forth gentleness. So it's God's Spirit helps us to be more gentle. So that's part of our ministry. We say, Lord, help me to lovingly correct people and care enough to do it, even though it's hard. But Father, help me to be filled with your Spirit and be filled with gentleness so I can choose the right words and be sensitive when I talk to the person, but not so sensitive that I don't speak the truth to them. But when I speak the truth, let them know I love them and I, and I care about them and I want to see them restored. Amen? And let them know I'm there for them. I'm there to pray for them. I'm there to cry out to God on their behalf, and so forth. We need to love people, guys. God wants us to love everybody, amen? Not just love each other. Jesus says, what better are you if you love your own? Because even the pagans do that. We need to love our enemies if we want to be like our Father in heaven. We need to love the lost, love that don't know, those that don't know God, but love the brethren, too, when they go astray, amen? You know, in uh, 2 Timothy uh, I'm sorry, in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, you can go there. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This is a powerful passage because here he's talking about a couple of false teachers in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and he says about them, he says in verse 18, This I command and I trust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prof uh, prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith, verse 19, keeping faith, and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. They've shipwrecked their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus. They, it doesn't say they didn't have faith. Their faith got shipwrecked, and it was good. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been, uh, it wouldn't be a bad thing that it was shipwrecked if it was false. Among these are Hymenaeus, okay, and Alexander, whom I have, Humaneas in the Greek. Hymenaeus and Alexander, we say, whom I have handed over to who? Satan, so that they will be what? Taught not to blaspheme. Isn't that heavy? Here's two false teachers leading people astray, and God's still concerned about their souls. He's handing them to Satan so they'd be taught, they'd learn a lesson not to blaspheme. Jezebel was leading people astray. God, Jesus says, I gave her time to repent. Revelation chapter 2. Wow. Even Jezebel. And here he has patience with these men. And in 2 Timothy, if you go to the next book, look what he says, even about these false teachers. Verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be what? 2 Timothy 2.24. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but must be what? Kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Maybe God will use you. You'll be the one he uses to bring them repentance through you. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. You know, it's really serious because these false teachers... The reason, what happens, guys, is in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, if your brother is involved in sin, go to him privately, see? You go to him privately, and you say, hey, bro, I love you, man, but are you involved? It looks like, you know, what's going on here? And, and if you know he's involved in sin, and, you, and it's a fact, man. Dude, you got to repent. You got to turn. And then if he doesn't hear you, it says, bring one or two with you. So you're kind of upping the ante, bringing more pressure. And if he still refuses to turn, let's say, let's say you know, he's, 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 he loves meth, you know, and he beats his wife or something, and he won't stop, and, and you're like, man, you, and then you bring one or two, and he still doesn't hear you. Then guess what? Then it says, bring it before the church. If he doesn't hear the church, let him be considered a tax gatherer and a heathen. That means to be separated from the church. doesn't mean you don't love him, you don't pray for him, but he's outside of now what? The domain of the Spirit. He's under Satan's power now. Just like Hymenaeus and Alexander were delivered over to who? Satan, because now he's a Satan's kingdom. He's not getting the joy of the Lord anymore. And guess what? God's disciplining him to bring him back. 
And in 1 Corinthians 5, remember that's the chapter where this guy is in the church at Corinth, and he's having sexual relations with his father's wife, it says. And Paul says to excommunicate that, from, that man from your midst, you know. He says, because a little bit of leaven, what? Leaven's a whole lump. A little bit of yeast affects the whole cake, doesn't it? But in this case, that little bit, of, if you let him abide there and he continues to live in rebellion to God and encourage other people in that rebellion, he'll destroy the whole church like yeast affects the whole loaf of bread. And even with this guy, these, these false teachers, if you back up just a few verses, look at verse 16 in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk, speaking of these false teachers, will spread like what? Gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they what? Up, up, they're teaching false doctrine, and they upset the faith of some. Other translations, they overthrow the faith of some. They're destroying people's faith in their, do, in their doctrine. Just like this man's immorality could spread like yeast, this, this, their false doctrine spreads like gangrene. You ever see gangrene? Think of like staff, a little different, but it needs to be excised or it spreads and destroys the whole body and the brain. Amen? Keep Bob Kincaid in mind. He's got staff. He's getting better. I don't see him back there today, so pray, pray, pray for him. What's that? He's ushering? Is he touching people? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Praise God. He's not infected, he, the doctors told him. So, I mean, he's not contagious, I should say, or infectious. But you know what? It says when that brother comes back, because that brother who's having sexual relations with his stepmom or his father's wife, we don't know exactly the natural relation there, come, when he comes back in 2 Corinthians, you know what Paul says? Remember what he says? To do three things. And this is important. You should know these three things. How many know what three things Paul tells him to do when this guy comes back? Can you name one of them? Well, accept him, that's, that's, that would basically underline all three of them. But three specific things that have to do with accepting him. That's right, though, Carol. Forgive him, for we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Right? Comfort him. Right? Number two. And what? Reaffirm your love for him. And why do you think Paul has to say that? Because he thinks the church of Corinth will say, wow, we didn't know that the guy was that bad. And now some were accepting him when he was doing it, and that was going to destroy the whole church. And they were patting his back while he's I'm on the back while he's going to hell because in the next chapter, Paul says, don't be deceived. Fornicators will not enter the kingdom of God. He was going to hell. And they had a libertine uh, element in the church that was destroying the church. And Paul said, I've already judged. Have him out of the church. Can't, you, you, in the church, he goes, you're supposed to judge all things. Ex, 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 you know, excommunicate him. But now he's going to come back, and there's another faction of the church that's too unloving and won't accept him back. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. This guy's repented. Forgive him, comfort him, and reaffirm your love toward him. Amen? Brothers and sisters, can we get the balance right when, and, and, and be wise rebukers in a loving way that only do it when it's necessary over serious, over real, I should say, over real sin issues? Amen? And do it in a gentle way, in a loving way, but also not be libertines who let anything go and then let people get destroyed. That's not love. But also not be legalists when somebody comes back and they're repentant and give them the cold shoulder as though you're holier than thou. That's ungodly too. Amen? Let's strike the biblical balance. Let's seek to be spiritual so we can restore people in a spirit of gentleness. That's one of your ministries. God has given us, the Bible says, the ministry of what? Starts with an R. Reconciliation. So the lost, we have a ministry to preach the gospel to them. Amen? Those who are saved but then go astray, then we're supposed to bring them back. Reconciliation. We are our brother's keepers. Amen? So if you see someone in Blessed Hope and you fellowship with them and you don't see them for a while, pray for them, but also reach out to them and encourage them. I leave you with this verse. Verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Amen? Be a wise rebuker in these days. Love people enough to tell them to turn before it's too late. Amen? Be their best friend, and that's how you, you do it. Amen? But also, keep your distance, and don't be sucked in to accepting sin and a sinful lifestyle, lest you be infected and you get dragged down to hell with them. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much. You are so good. We praise your holy name. Father, we pray if there's anybody in our assembly this day, 
If there's anybody listening by way of podcast or CD or however, Father, YouTube or whatever, we pray in your son's name that if they don't know you, that you would let them know you love them so much that you gave your son to be slaughtered on the cross instead of them so they would not have to be separated from you forever, Father, in a Christless eternity. And that he took our punishment as the God-man so that we could be forgiven. And we pray if that's you and you don't know Jesus, he loves you. Turn right now. Repent. Why would you not obey the word? Why would you reject the, the free gift of eternal life? Say, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I put my trust in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I obey the gospel. I repent. I turn to Jesus and embrace him through faith as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you put your trust in him, you'll pass from death to life and not come into condemnation. Do that now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Let's pass out the cup and the bread. If everybody could please stand, that'd be great.